Nick Powell-Palm is the owner of Cold Springs Organics in Belgrade, Montana, where he raises organic beef, grains, pulses, and flax. Nate started farming when he was just 12 years old as part of a 4-H project and used grants and other opportunities to develop and expand his cattle operation in Bozeman, Montana. As a farmstead member of the Organic Trade Association through Montana Organic Association, Nate is a spokesperson for organic agriculture at the national level. Nate is passionate about building a food system that supports everyone. So thank you so much for joining us, Nate. Yes, thank you for having me. Excited uh, to be here. I was listening in on some of the earlier sessions um, and it's a really neat conversation to be having, especially in the, the Montana, Dakota area. Um, so again, my name is Nate Powell Palm. Good to be with you all. I'm based out of Bozeman, Montana, and I operate Cold Springs Organics. We have just about a thousand acres of um, crop ground um, that we rotate with both pasture and forage production, as well as those oil seeds, pulses, and cereals. Um, primarily raising durum and yellow peas and flax this year, um, along with what little alfalfa we were able to convince the weather to give us. Um, it's been very dry where we, are, where we are, and I think it has been where you all are as well. Um, so I got started in organics um, a little bit down the way. I got certified in 2008, and so I've been at it for a bit, but I did, um, I am a first-generation farmer, and so had to kind of build this idea from scratch as to what I wanted a career in production agriculture to look like. Um, and on the way, I had to ultimately develop this mindset for, for how am I going to be in agriculture, able to make a living and, and ultimately, um, existing within this greater, uh, kind of thought ecosystem that doesn't necessarily agree with organics. Um, I've got lots of conventional neighbors, mostly conventional neighbors. I think I'm the only organic grain grower in my County. Um, and I need to rely on them to learn how to farm, to get better at farming, possibly to borrow some equipment or to use some contractors. Um, and so I had to approach organics from a place where I wasn't highlighting the differences, but rather um, really celebrating the similarities between the goals of all farmers. Our goals being that we want to be able to make a living from the land, steward the land effectively, um, and ultimately build a business that's going to be something of value and ultimately something we can pass on, hopefully. Um, and Claire, if you want to monitor the chat, I'm happy to take questions as we go. Um, if there's anything folks want to throw in the chat box, otherwise I'll just kind of dive in and we can chat afterwards. Okay. Sounds good. So when I was getting into organics, all of my mentors, um, were basically saying that, why would you want to do something that's just going to be a weedy mess? Um, you're not going to make any money because it's poor yielding. Um, ultimately you're sort of getting rid of the obligation of the farmer to feed the world. You're not, you're not gonna be able to feed the world. And in a lot of ways, organics, because we do use tillage is seen as this step backwards from all the progress we've made towards no-till. And so those are four assumptions that I've really had to figure out, okay, if I'm going to be an organic farmer building this business, um, how do I honor those skepticism to make sure I really don't make them true? How do I stay and keep fields clean? How do I get as good a yield as I possibly can? Um, and how do I do it with uh, a conservation mindset? And so I am exclusively a, a tenant farmer, so I don't own any farmland. Um, and so I've uh, spent the last about decade, decade and a half building relationships with landlords, um, which is a little bit tricky, a little bit different than what we might do in the conventional world. I have um, alternative crops. It's not just in my area, it's mostly wheat and alfalfa, maybe a little bit of barley. So when we get flax and pulses, the fields look different than say their neighbors might. Um, and there's, there are weeds, there are more weeds than, uh, than my conventional neighbors. So when approaching landlords, I've had to sort of assume some of their assumptions and, and be ready to have a conversation. So the idea that organic is weedy and could make it so that the, you know, they have a big mess to clean up when I'm done. I have to really be thinking about that. How am I going to go on to a farm, um, rent the ground? Probably the ground is going to have some weed problems already. If it's ready to be organic, it's going to have been not sprayed for three years. Um, how am I going to make sure that the, the, um, the rent is sufficient enough to, to make the landlords happy? Um, kind of talk about that yield question. Uh, will I be making enough 
to ultimately make rent. Um, how do I keep their land sort of the pride of the neighborhood and not the joke? Making sure that we farm in a way that keeps everybody impressed with our operation rather than um, the, the sort of the talk of the, around the coffee shop of how ugly organics is. Um, and then also looking at lease agreements. So in looking at all of this, um, I really try to figure out what is it that I need to do as a producer to hit these assumptions right up front and make sure the landlord is a good fit, that they're the type of, type of person who's going to be um, a, a willing and eager and capable partner for lacing me this land. Um, so starting kind of on the, the number four, annual lease agreements in organics, because we have this transition period where we have to farm for three years um, transition, and then we get to go into organic certified status. Um, we need a little bit longer leases. And so I always approach landlords saying, I need at least a five-year lease if I'm going to be able to, to work with you, because I need to get through that transition period. And then a couple years, at least of, um, of certified organic crop sales opportunities. Um, and then I have to, and I've been working on this for quite a long time, come up with a rotation that ultimately keeps weeds at bay and makes it so that we've got good looking fields. Um, so my crop rotation primarily consists of a year of Durham, and then we go into flax and then peas, um, and then alfalfa. And that alfalfa period is what really cleans it up. So I have alfalfa in rotation on all of my ground. I have organic beef cattle as well as crop ground. Um, so I have a, a, a known market for that alfalfa. But ultimately, it's, um, it's a way to, to keep weeds and keep fields looking good, weeds under control and fields looking good. Um, and it's the primary source of nitrogen for my crops. So when I'm looking to raise high protein durum that has good test weight, um, I'm ultimately looking at that, uh, that alfalfa to provide the nitrogen and to provide that clean start for my cereals and the other, other annual crops I raise between hay crops. So weeds in organics, especially, they reflect a little, they reflect your management. And so when we're thinking about how do we ultimately figure out what weeds we have, what's it going to take to get rid of them, and how do we keep them at bay, that's our crop rotation. That's the primary tool we have to fight weeds. Um, and I like to think about my weed management plan as not necessarily a means of getting rid of every weed, but getting weeds to a, a manageable level that isn't super ugly, doesn't economically impact the crop, um, and ultimately isn't a growing presence. Um, so I don't have to hit a point where I just have to tear everything out or terminate a, what could be a cash crop for hay. Um, so we need to think about how we holistically manage the weeds and create that rotation, growing different crops that we might not necessarily grow as if we were conventional. Um, the longer the crop rotation I found, and several studies have supported this, the longer the crop rotation, the more weeds can be suppressed. And so when we're thinking about what we'd like to grow organically, um, organic wheat has a good price, but it's just, it's, it's not good for suppressing weeds. You're going to, when we grow cereals, at least in Montana, that's when our weeds really start to catch up. Um, but yellow peas do a good job breaking up that cycle, that disease, that pest cycle, um, ultimately fixing a little bit of nitrogen themselves. Um, but also as kind of a smother crop, I found that I plant my yellow peas at about 200 pounds an acre. Um, and that the yellow pea carpet that comes up um, is a vine. And so it's going to be pulling down a lot of the weeds, messing up their reproductive cycles, um, ultimately giving them some competition. And so after alfalfa, we'll do the, the durum and then the yellow, then the flax and then the yellow peas, um, or switch it out in there in some way, um, before we go back to hay. And so weeds are always getting a little bit more, we get a little bit more of a presence of weeds during the annual cropping rotation. So I'm trying to figure out what I do to react to that, but ultimately know that because we're going back into hay, we'll be able to sell those weeds off, ultimately mine that seed bank to get rid of the weeds. Yield is something that is, um, is kind of an exciting part of organics. I, for a long time, there was a noticeable yield drag. Um, but as organics has used better and better seed, we are able to, on the whole, use the best genetics out there. It can't be GMO. So in the, corn of, in the case of corn and beans, um, we have to use non-GMO varieties. 
but most of the crops that will grow in Western North Dakota and Montana, uh, wheat, pulses, um, the oil seeds, not including canola, um, aren't going to have a GMO variety. So we have a lot of options there. So I've, for the last few years, this year was definitely an exception um, because of the drought. But for the last few years, I've definitely been able to hit that 40 to 50 bushel an acre yellow peas. Um, and similar for Durham, about 50, 60 bushel dry land of Durham. Um, and so the, the real ticket with that is making sure that we've come up with a system to suppress those weeds um, and ultimately do a good job seeding, managing, tilling. Um, because we're tilling and we're not able to do a true no-till operation, we really have to manage for water in our operation. We have to figure out how do we till in such a way that we get that maximum weed kill while also um, not releasing so much soil moisture that we don't have anything for the crop when we go in. Um, a few studies have shown that the longer you're inorganic, the better your yields ultimately become. And so a couple of studies have shown that over a 14 year period, the yields almost even out after a while. After that soil gets used to being farmed organic, you've got a good system down to control the weeds and you figured out your management of your fertility. Um, a lot of folks in organics do use inputs for fertility like manure or pelletized poultry litter. I'm able to mostly rely on, um, on crop rotation. So really relying on pulses and on our uh, hay um, part of the rotation. Additionally, we look to, um, to figure out what is the best market. So we're not just looking to try to produce the absolute most wheat or peas or flax, but also what is the crop that folks are willing to pay for? So I got into yellow peas because I got a, um, a contract, a food grade contract with um, General Mills to raise it for a mac and cheese product as a, a flour ingredient. Um, and I hadn't really raised yellow peas before then. It was a bit of a leap. There aren't a lot of yellow peas raised in my area, so I didn't have a lot of neighbors to lean on. Um, but it ultimately, I knew that the money would be good enough if I could figure out how to get the crop out of the field. And so I always look to make sure that when I'm thinking about a crop, um, I'm not trying to budget for the best yields possible, which definitely was proven out um, one shouldn't do based on this year's drought, but, um, but also looking at how do we get a crop that's valuable enough, has a market, ideally has a contract already signed before a plant is saying that um, the buyer is going to buy everything we grow um, so that we know that we're going to be able to have a home for everything. And that informs, informs the crop rotation, um, as well as the ability to not necessarily worry about having the absolute max yields, but sort of those more average yields all in all. Were there any questions or anything so far, Claire? Uh, no, not at the moment. All right, sounds good. Um, when we talk about ugly crops, this is, I think, something that um, we've, if you've seen an organic field, I'm sure you've seen an ugly organic field. Um, and, and there's a lot to say about how we control weeds and how we get crops to look uniform and good. And a lot of it is just good agronomy practices, you know, having your, your cedar set right, making sure that your tillage was sufficient to create a good seed bed. Um, but when we look at ultimately beating that weed, um, component of the production, uh, equation, we're really trying to figure out what is it about our rotation that makes this easy? How do we have a rotation that makes it so we're not fighting weeds, but we're always staying a step ahead of them? And so when I see a bunch of wheat with, you know, uh, you know, a good stand of weeds in it, ultimately I'm thinking that there's probably not a hay component to it. We haven't given that field a chance to rest and ultimately pulled off those weed seed heads um, in the form of hay. And so when thinking about our rotation and how to get a good clean looking crop, we really need to be ready to embrace some sort of cover crop or some sort of hay period where we can interrupt, we can use all of our tools that we have in controlling weeds. We can interrupt the weed production um, with tillage. If we have a cover crop, a green manure, we're able to just to hay it off before it's mature. So we don't have a growing seed bank in the soil um, and we're able to outcompete it to plant something that is maybe planting it a little heavier than we would for, um, for cash crop for cereal, say if we're doing an annual hay barley or something, um, we can plant it as heavy as we need to ultimately compete out those weeds and produce a decent hay crop that, uh, that has some value, but also makes it so that we can mine off that seed bank.
Um, in organics, there's the, also the chance that um, you're going to be using manure on a field. And if manure is cheap, sometimes we can overdo it. And so without herbicides, our fertility in the soil becomes very apparent. And so when we're looking at um, figuring out how to get enough nitrogen and enough NPK in the soil to meet the crops needs, um, with manure, we can sometimes overdo it, have too much of one, uh, one, for, uh, one nutrient. Um, and that oftentimes shows in what types of weeds we have in the field. And so getting comfortable identifying the weeds identifying their life cycles, looking at what, um, what our rotation should be in order to reflect and combat those weed pressures that are particular to a given field, um, I found to be a really crucial means of staying ahead of having an, an ugly crop, keeping crops and fields fairly clean um, and yields up there. When I'm talking about leases with farmers, um, I have to sell my relationship to my landlords a little bit different. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, what the farmer, what the landlord's going to be getting out of the relationship, um, there's always going to be a check um, on the whole. So I usually do just cash leases as opposed to crop share. But for the first eight or nine years, I did crop share, um, which totally worked out. But um, but in discussing what we're doing for the land as organic farmers, a lot of my landlords. Um, have have overtly put value on the the ecological benefits of organic farming on their land, um, and I found a lot of landlords have been seeking out organic farmers, um, partially because of the landlord's own philosophy about land stewardship, but also because, on the whole, I'm going to be grossing more dollars per acre than necessarily my conventional counterparts, and so they know it's a pretty good bet that um, that I'm going to be a steady steady source of income for them as a tenant. Um, in exchange though, uh, we talk about, you know, there's gonna be possibly more weeds. We're gonna be growing alternative crops that you're maybe not used to looking at um, as, a, as a landowner. And, um, and we're, we're building something. We're building all this stable soil fertility. We're working the weeds out over long-term crop rotation. Um, and once we get to a good steady state with our crop rotation, it's likely that we're going to be able to keep those weeds at bay. Um, and we also, in some ways, and I know everyone probably from North Dakota can appreciate this, um, flax and yellow peas and pulses, they're kind of fun looking crops. And so I found that landlords are actually uh, interested in sort of the aesthetics of these alternative crops um, that maybe not uh, haven't, haven't really found a, a real big following, uh, at least in my area, not a lot of uh, flax or peas grown, um, but they look cool. They look cool and they're, they're part of a more dynamic farming system that landlords, I feel, at least in my experience, have been able to appreciate. Um, all of that said, like I mentioned in the beginning, I do need that longer term lease. I really don't chase leases that are only a year. Even if the ground is ready to be certified organic, um, no ground coming out of, say, a hay field, uh, sort of a, a poorly managed hay field, or just a fallow situation is going to be very good in those first few years. It takes a while to get the rotation going and to get the land adapted to being farmed organically. And so that's why I always try to get at least a five year lease, if not a little bit longer. Um, the other component, and this isn't necessarily true in my neighborhood, but, uh, um, in addition to farming, I've had the opportunity to work as an organic farm inspector. And so I've seen kind of these dynamics play out between farmers and landlords around the country when I inspect organic farms. Um, and in a lot of areas, landlords are excited to get their land certified because they know if one organic tenant isn't working out, there's others. There's other folks who are going to be able to um, fill this niche of growing growing crops in this uh, style, um, but also probably having that more consistent income from the fields every year. So thinking about qualities of a successful organic operator, um, as I've learned how to grow grain and learned how to run my business, um, in organics, especially timeliness, and especially in dry land, sort of high plains, dry land cropping systems, um, timing is really everything. So we have to think about all of the all of the impacts we have with our timing um, 
And so in the springtime, when we're thinking about how we're going to be getting the crop in the field, getting everything planted, we're also thinking about how do we get either a harrow or a tillage pass to knock out that first flush of weeds, since we don't have an herbicide to do that for us. Um, thinking about how do we get the, um, the crops off in a timely manner so that we can get a little bit of fall tillage done if that's part of our plan. Um, thinking about what, what goes into ultimately making the weeds chances for success um, on the farm ever dimmer. And so thinking about how we plan for that, we have to have a really well planned out crop rotation. Um, and so that's a bit of a balancing act for me. When I've been finding contracts um, to, uh, to ultimately contract out my acres, um, I found that those contracts aren't necessarily aligned with my crop rotation needs. So I need to grow pulses for the um, for both the, the soil for the nitrogen fixation, but also so I don't grow too many cereals or too many oil seeds in um, a given rotation to keep my disease and pest pressures down. Um, so thinking about how do I both build this crop rotation that's good for my soil, good for my weed control goals, but also I'm producing crops that people can contract is a bit of a challenge, but, um, but there's a lot of interest and in a lot of markets out there for pulses, lentils, chickpeas, yellow peas especially, um, and a growing interest in organic, um, organic oil seeds. Really like flax is just, I feel like it's always something that there's more demand than supply for, um, kind of across the board, but especially in organics. When thinking about um, running an organic farm, I've also thought you know, really hard about how do I, if I'm gonna have a little bit of a weedier field, how do I keep the field looking good and, and intentionally well-maintained? And so I try to run a brush hog around the outside edges of my field just to show that, um, that we're not gonna be a risk to the neighbors. If we do have weeds in the fields, we're trying not to get them too close to the fence line with our neighbors. Um, it's also good to have a buffer just sort of for my own field protection so that if there is any um, spray or any drift from my neighbors over to my field, it gets caught in the buffer and not on my crop. Um, but also, you know, trying to make it so that uh, that organic farming can just be sort of lovely and boring, that it's not something to be gossiped about and, uh, and looking at how do we be a good neighbor to everyone in, in our area. Um, I found that being comfortable with swathing, I found that there's, because we don't have any, um, we don't have as consistent a stand as we might with a good, uh, you know, protection package, like a seed treatment on our cereals. We sometimes get a little bit uneven um, emergence and then ultimately somewhat uneven uh, crops when we're getting ready to harvest. This is especially true for sort of uh, poorly determining crops like um, flax or lentils or these other crops that um, might ripen unevenly. Um, I just bought a grain swather. I think they're somewhat more common in North Dakota than Montana. They're, they're not super common in Montana, um, but bought a grain swather a few years ago just to make it so that I could get at those crops, you know, when the sun is shining and it's still hot out and I don't have to wait to go into very deep into the fall with these alternative crops that maybe haven't been bred as carefully as your more common cereals. Um, getting comfortable with cover crops, I think both organics and conventional, um, it's kind of a cover crop bonanza right now. There's a lot of folks trying different cover crops, getting more comfortable with cover crops. Um, but cover crops are in and of themselves a bit of a specialty. You have to be ready to understand what it is that your goals are for cover crops, how you make it financially work, picking out your cover crops, um, and, and ultimately using what grows well in your area. So lots of times I use peas um, as a cover crop just because seed is pretty cheap, all things considered. I'll then mix into that a variety of different things um, that kind of creates a good cocktail, good salad mix um, for my cows who I'll oftentimes graze on the cover crops um, and, and realize a little revenue from the grazing, possibly swap it down for some windrow grazing. Um, but ultimately try to keep it simple. I think there's a chance that we can get cover crops to be very complicated and kind of a headache. I don't grow any cover crops that I might think uh, could become a weed, could get away from me. Um, so haven't used a lot of vetch, um, haven't used very much rye, just because it's, it can be kind of a problem um, if it sticks around. And, uh, and so there's a lot of exciting cover crops out there, but picking the cover crops that are both fairly cheap to buy the seed, we know how to easily terminate them and they're gonna do a good job for us, is something that you wanna think about when 
establishing that rotation and thinking about what cover crops are a good fit. So organic is probably going to be more time intensive just because we have a few more activities we have to cover the land with. We're gonna have our tillage, we're gonna have our planting. Um, depending on what you're growing, you might have some post-planting weeds like some harrowing, or if you're growing corn, some cultivation. Um, and then ideally some, we're gonna have a little bit more uh, residue to incorporate. We're gonna have some more weeds that grew throughout the season. So we're probably gonna be doing a little bit of tillage in the fall to incorporate. Depending on where you are and your erosion risk, um, you might be leaning more towards fall or spring tillage, but um, I do a little bit in, in both. And so I have my residue incorporated in the fall. Um, I'm able to do a quick pass with tillage in the spring. Um, but on the whole, I basically do one good uh, disc or river pass um, a year and then harrowing otherwise. Just getting those small weeds when they're early in the spring um, is the primary uh, tillage that I do in the spring. Um, planting so that we can coordinate with our weed control efforts. So if we're able to blast our weeds with a harrow, um, get them out, get them weakened down, trying to plant as soon as we can to create competition for those weeds. To, we don't have a spray package um, to beat back the weeds when our plants are going. So coming up with um, good timing, I found to be critical in keeping those weeds at bay. Um, managing our soil building crops with our cash crops. I think that there's, there's a thought that we wanna be trying to get a cash crop every year. And I think when we think about the fact that in organics, we really don't have much of a relationship with a fertilizer dealer on the whole. Um, we grow our own fertility, either through grazing, rotation, or cover crops. Um, and so when you have kind of years off where you're, where you're growing a, a green manure crop, um, I'd like to think of it not so much as this is the year where I'm not getting paid for a cash crop, but rather doing a one-to-one -one comparison with this year and the money I've invested this year is my fertilizer bill. Um, and it's ultimately going to then be reflected when I do the accounting for my cash crops, my cereals, flax, and uh, yellow peas. Um, I think that there's, as we, as we grow um, more alternative crops, again, we might be faced with needing to swath. Um, so harvest might be a little bit more cumbersome. I know that when I go through a field that's maybe in year three of my annual part of the rotation, I'm going to be dealing with more weeds. That's going to be a buildup of weeds over the, that time. And I'm probably going to have to combine a little slower. There's just going to be, it's going to be a little bit harder on my combine. Um, but if I done an okay job, it shouldn't be anything that the combine can't handle. So in planning out my cropping system, um, I really want to highlight kind of what the goals are with the crop rotation. Um, so I'm trying to get, you know, meet these contracts that I found. So I've got a contract for Durham, yellow peas and flax, and then I need alfalfa for my cows. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out how to get those all in a rotation, um, not have any stack up of disease pressures, not grow yellow peas too many times in a row, um, not run up any disease or pest pressures that might give me a hard time. Um, but also try to ultimately build that soil fertility so that at any one time I'm adding more to the soil than I'm taking out. Um, depending on the weather, this year was a really good example. Um, things don't always go as planned. And so I ended up uh, haying quite a bit of my, my ground because um, it either didn't make grain or it was just doing so poorly that I knew I was going to need to hay. And so I took some of my cereals, um, some of my peas and just made hay out of them. Um, and, uh, and that, that was a, a benefit ultimately to my weed control. Um, uh, every time you hay in organics, you're, you're interrupting the life cycle of the weeds a little bit better than if those cash crops go to uh, maturation, um, trying to work proactively and come up with different plans. So if you're growing, if you know, you can grow three or four different crops, and maybe some of you can grow a lot more than that, um, Having all of those in the back of your head as you watch the winter and the spring um, evolve and thinking about what we want to plant in order to reflect our best conditions, whatever Mother Nature's thrown at us, having an idea of what we can plant, having a few different options just makes organic work that so much more. If we just rely on, say, alfalfa in Durham or just Durham and peas, um, I found that that makes farmers have to ultimately work harder to try to keep that system 
um, in check. When we have only annuals, there's a lot more weed pressures. There's a lot more potential for erosion since we don't have that break for the hay where we can till a little bit less. Um, and, uh, and having everything in say spring crops or annuals also makes years like this year um, that much harder when we have a drought. The alfalfa um, was able to tap a lot more deep down and, um, and I know it would have been a lot harder to get enough hay had I not had that perennial component of my operation. Again, um, as I think about being an organic farmer and especially an organic farmer primarily around conventional farmers, I'm always thinking about how do I make an operation um, that can command a little bit of respect, that I'm not, the, I'm not the weed problem in the neighborhood, but rather figuring out how do I keep fields looking good and, and still work within the organic uh, regulations. Again, being cover comfortable with cover crops is an evolution. I think it's quietly trying out different things in your area that that might work. So I've raised um, I've raised peas as cover crops. I've raised vet, vetch, and and that made me understand that I don't want to raise that again. Um, I've raised some sunflowers that I tilled in. Um, I raise a lot of clover, and with my cereals, I always plant a little bit of clover and a little bit of alfalfa, maybe two to six pounds an acre, um, just mixed in with the durum um, in order to keep some amount of legumes growing year round in all of my fields. Um, and that's a, it's an art. And so I oftentimes have to dial it back if I feel like I've put too much legumes and I have alfalfa and clover competing with my cereals. Um, but ultimately when I go to my hay year, there's already a little bit of an established community, plant community, that's ready to be uh, ready to spring to life when I want to give the land a rest. Um, I started my my entire business with cattle, and so cattle is a really integral part of my operation. And so when I'm thinking about my crop rotation, I'm also thinking: if something goes wrong, can I feed it to a cow? Can that cow clean up my mistakes? Um, and having a little bit of a sort of a, a salad bar underneath the canopy of all my cash crops in the form of clover or other perennials that are not necessarily super thick, but always going to be growing, makes it so that I know in the fall, I'm going to have something for the cows to eat in that stubble. That's not just the wheat stubble. Um, so I want to keep my cows fat and happy as much as I can and have them helping me with all of these, these different components of my cover of my crop rotation. Um, calling up, uh, depending on how familiar everyone is with cover crops, I found a lot of these private cover crop companies to be really useful in their recommendations. Coming up with a plan based on your goals with one of these agronomists has been really helpful for me. I know there's a lot of cover crop research being done both at, um, in Montana as well as North Dakota. And I think all land grant universities are somewhat touching on cover crops. So looking up what things have been done recently, um, but also just saying, you know, what cheap seed is out there and what can I experiment with? Um, try not to do too big of an experiment at once in case something gets away from you. But I think every single field is going to be unique and your ability to grow different types of cover crops um, is going to be really place dependent. So you want to give yourself the chance to experiment with these different things um, and, and find what's best for you. Thinking about cover crops as one of the most versatile tools in your organic toolbox has been really beneficial to me. When I, I've had, there's been several years in the, in the past where we've had super wet rains, like I think of 2019, it just never seemed to stop raining, very different than this year. Um, and, and throwing in some cover crops ultimately made it so that I took a little bit of the pressure off of what I needed to get done for my cash crops. I had a little bit more flexibility with um, what I hate off, what I terminated, what I ultimately just grazed. Um, and I knew that because of that, uh, the, the climatic conditions that year, um, I was gonna be able to still manage it all, but build soil um, in preparation for the next cover crop season um, altogether. So it took me a while, and I apologize if this is redundant for all of you, but um, being from a place that we don't swath very much, um, I really had to get used to the idea of getting a pickup header and getting a swather and being ready to swath as both a, a sort of a last resort weed control, but also just to make sure I get all my work done. Um, if you have a field of say wheat or barley or other cereal that's looking pretty dirty, a lot of weeds, the, you know, the rotation just hasn't really beat the weeds yet. I found that swathing can be an absolute lifesaver 
because once we're you know post that uh, that milk stage and we've got some grain in the head, um, we can swap pretty early and still realize that yield in the grain. Um, but we can also beat your thistles and your um, Chinese lettuce and all these different crops that you might have in your field. Um, beat them to the point before they're already producing seed. Um, lay them down. It's easier on your combine to have a dry crop that has a little bit of time to dry out rather than um, trying to burn through all of these weeds. Um, but then also use it to make sure you can beat back the weeds and not have a growing problem of a weed seed bank developing in your soil. So I think I've touched on the landlords a lot. I think as a tenant, I think about landlord relations a lot. Um, when hunting out land, I often look for folks who might have hay or alfalfa already in their fields because the transition might already be underway um, so that I don't have to wait the whole three years as a producer. Um, with going organic, you have to get a legally binding affidavit from whoever was managing the land. Um, for the three years prior to certification. And so if I find a landlord who has a stand of alfalfa, they haven't sprayed anything on it, they're willing to legally swear that nothing's been put down and there's no evidence of any prohibited materials, then I might be able to walk right into that lease ready to go and certify um, my first crop as organic. Um, come walking into a, a good stand of alfalfa also means that your weed pressures are pretty easy. Um, when thinking about rotation, I think a lot of folks in, in the rotation to get from conventional to organic, try to figure out how do I make money during that, um, that transition year? I'm gonna have a hit to my yields because my land was used to getting this, um, this fertilizer that uh, now I can't use because we don't use synthetic fertilizer in organics, but I'm also not gonna have, so I'm not gonna have the yield, but I'm also not gonna have the price support. I'm not gonna get that organic premium during my transition. And so I really like and, and I do this with most of my crops, I really like just using the transition period as a forage period. So I'm gonna raise possibly alfalfa over those three years. I might just raise a different suite of like hay, barley and peas, um, forage peas in a, in a cocktail and hay that off, might just hay off peas, ultimately trying to see what can I do over those three years to build nitrogen and to get rid of weeds. So I'm ready and I'm in a much better position when I can realize that organic premium. So if I can find a landlord that has alfalfa already, that's a really easy transition for me. Um, and I walk into a situation where probably some of the work of weed control and nitrogen building has already been done. Um, because of these longer, more phenotypically diverse rotations that we have to do, um, finding you know, landlords who will do three to five year contracts, I think is just an absolute baseline for me. I can't do annual contracts on the whole. Other folks might be able to. I found that it just, um, the investment that I put into a field with my rotation and, uh, and the risk and the time that I'm putting into a field, um, I need that five-year chance to recoup and profit from that field. Um, making sure I have a good plan also makes my landlord relationships more positive. Um, if something happens in the weather or like this year, I drought out, um, I want to have some sort of plan so I know that I can keep fields looking good, keep moving forward, um, and ultimately not, not kind of give organics the black eye as something that, uh, that, that we only had one plan and when it failed, we were just kind of uh, left without a, a backup. So like I said, the benefits of starting out with a perennial field, um, and this would be more perennial field that's been actively managed rather than a fallow field, um, is that we might have some good haying, some clipping, some management that's been going on that's been suppressing weeds. Um, it's also a good chance that we had some nitrogen bank um, to start to pull from when we go organic. Um, during that, I think of transition again as this period of how do we spend as little money as possible rather than how do I try to make as much money as possible during transition. I just want transition to be not very expensive. And so if we have a perennial that we can hay during the transition period, um, that means we're going to get some sort of sellable crop off of it or grazing value out of it. Um, but also we're doing, we're meeting those two goals of suppressing weeds and building a nitrogen bank and not spending money on seeds. Other folks I've seen um, jump, sort of look to the perennial as a, as a path to transition um, can also run into train wrecks. 
So when we're looking at a perennial field that might have just been fallow and it's just been left for a few years, it might be old CRP that's not been broken up yet, um, but out of the program. Those fields can often be just an incredible weed seed bank that the second you take some steel to them, the second you start doing tillage, um, you awaken all of those weed seeds that have just been sitting there. Um, so not we don't want to treat every perennial field um, as as an as equal when we're starting out into the organic transition. We want to think about how has this land been managed in order to ultimately have a good control on weeds and possibly have a little bit of a nitrogen credit. If we're coming out of CRP, probably it's the case that we actually have all of our nitrogen tied up in whatever the biomass above ground is. And so thinking about how do we get that nitrogen cycling again in the ground? Um, if I'm coming out of a sort of what I consider more of a, um, a fallow um, uh, situation where we have minimal management, lots of grasses, uh, not a whole lot of legume presence, then usually I'll start with some sort of forage pea or some other um, perennial or annual legume in order to get the nitrogen cycling through that soil um, and trying to build up a credit so that when I go to Durham, which is my primary cash crop, um, I've got enough of a nitrogen presence in the soil to make sure I, good, I produce a good quality product. Um, so be, be ready to talk about, you know, what cover crops could you use during transition? How might you employ hay? How might you build a relationship with some of your neighbors who need hay? I know in Montana, anyone who has hay has friends. And so if you have hay, there's going to be a lot of folks who need it. Um, and so I think as part of our as part of our operation as grain growers, the incorporation of hay, I have found to be nothing but a benefit, both for our own cattle, making sure we have enough feed, also to develop relationships with other folks who have livestock, um, and then to make sure that we're, we're ultimately making money when we're growing our um, nitrogen, in the case of our alfalfa, rather than um, paying to bring it on. One more thing to say about uh, the three to five year leases that we work with um, is that we, I do want to set, um, we don't have as many tools in the toolbox when we're uh, farming organically. And so when we're building, when I was building this business, I wanted to also see how can I mitigate risk a little bit. Um, so I don't necessarily bid up a lot higher than the going uh, land rate, but I sometimes put some sort of incentive that if um, we hit a certain bushel or yield, or we hit a certain price, um, there would be some sort of bump for the landlord. Um, alternatively, if we hit a really bad um, drought like this year, where we lose a lot of production, um, it's we can even out and we might, um, the landlord might cut us a little bit of a break um, if we had really poor yields. Um, so I think with this landlord talk, a lot of it has come down to just building these strong relationships where we're only working with folks who are rooting us on and wanting to see us succeed. Um, and we try to make it worth their time as best we can. Being a little bit flexible about spring versus winter crops. This is again, just making sure that we have enough tools in our toolbox. Um, I have primarily relied on spring crops and it really hurt me this year. Um, if I had had winter wheat or another winter crop, um, I probably could have realized a little bit more um, yield across the board. So I have my own further diversification goals, um, but trying to make, make your operation as diverse as possible within the confines of being manageable um, has been, I think, the solution for a lot of folks getting into organics and staying in organics. Um, making sure you have a good, you're raising crops that folks want, so you have a contract for them, but you're also raising crops that spread the risk a little bit over everything. And so this was just a slide I wanted to put out there that I think there's some perceptions you have to have a big um, shift of the mindset in order to become an organic farmer. You have to get a really thick skin so you don't... Uh, don't get as offended when people make fun of your, your less than perfect fields. Um, but I think the identity of a successful organic farmer is just the identity of a successful farmer, that every farmer wants to be a clean farmer. We don't wanna be trouble for the neighbors. And so thinking of how as an organic farmer, we adopt practices that are gonna put us in an advantageous position to hit that goal. Um, we know that we can get good yields in organics. It's just gonna be 
finding that balance between the absolute maximum yield and the best net dollars per acre we can make given our contracting situations and the needs of our rotation. Um, good pest and disease control primarily come from the fact that we're going to be having a more diverse rotation that doesn't, um, doesn't put too much pressure on any one species in the rotation. And then trying to just, you know, think about all the potential backup plans we could have when one of our, uh, one piece of our rotation fails or a crop just doesn't work out for our area, or we hit a big drought coming up with different things that we can do, um, to make it so that we can keep going forward and we don't uh, fall too flat when we um, when we have an upset. Clean farmers in organics uh, do exist. They're going to be the ones that incorporate a forage into the rotation, and they're going to be those most timely ones. I like to think of the buffers as just that neutral zone where we can keep um, everybody happy, keep things clipped, keep things clean. Um, but ultimately, we, the folks who rely on a good, strong crop rotation can have really clean fields. As we said before, yield drag is, uh, is, is lessening. We have less of a yield drag across the board with our, between organics and conventional. Um, one thing I think folks are talking about more and more these days, and I might be wrong about this, but uh, in some conversations I've had, um, talking about net revenue per acre. How much profit are we actually making off of our fields rather than looking at how many bushels did we make has been a real a real mind sh mindset shift for me um, and also a more of a fun way to engage my neighbors when they're kind of saying, oh, didn't look like you got much off that field. I'm, and I can say, well, but the gross the gross and the net revenue were actually pretty good, even though the the yield on its surface was a little bit less. So understanding what our actual goals are in organics and in farming in general. And I think it's, it's an exciting time to think about um, how do we make farming as profitable as we can and not just get stuck trying to get as many bushels as possible. Pest control and weed control both really come from our crop rotation. We don't use a lot of tools in, uh, in building a healthy cropping operation. Um, by tools, I mean material tools. So we don't have very many sprays. We don't have a lot of um, reactive tools. We're gonna to be using crop rotation to ultimately make it so that we have a very inhospitable environment for our, the, the, the pests and diseases that we have in our area. Being proactive in organic is just essential. And so when I'm thinking about um, what is it that I could be doing to ultimately um, improve my timing, what could I be doing to reduce any one, uh, the pressure of performance under any one period? So how do I plant crops that are gonna mature at different times? How do I not put all of my eggs in one basket with a given crop? Um, and how do I make it so that the, the land is working for me? The land is ultimately making it so that I'm not out there reacting to weeds, I'm not fighting disease and pests, but I'm just planting things in an order and a crop rotation that make it so that I have good weed control, but also building soil fertility so I can raise good quality crops that folks wanna buy. And that's it, Claire. I would love, love to engage some questions. Um, so you emphasize the importance of crop rotations, yeah. um, and lengthening rotations. How long do you keep alfalfa in? Great question. Yeah. So it kind of depends on what my goal is. Um, but I'd say at least three years, if it's a really good stand and it's just pumping out the tons, then up to like six or seven years. Um, we, if I have a really good crop price for, um, for my other annuals, like my Durham or my flax or my peas, I might lessen that time in alfalfa um, and, and take it out a little bit earlier just so I can get back to growing those more revenue generating crops, um, but on the whole, a minimum of three years. And then do you, um, that rotation of flax, durum, P alfalfa, is that pretty fixed for you or do you ever switch up the order at all or? Definitely switch up the yeah. annual order. So there's, because they're so different, the flax, the peas and the durum, I don't really have any disease pressures coming out of alfalfa. And so I can grow them in any order I want. Um, usually my best uh, uh, protein is realized after alfalfa with the Durham. But, um, but if, I have a, 
big um, demand for any one of those crops, I might reflect the market with, uh, with the plantings and the rotation order. And then I'm always, always on the hunt for other markets. So if there's other crops out there that someone's approached me to grow or that I know has a really good price, um, I'll absolutely try those out. So I do grow other things like um, we've grown lentils very recently. We've grown um, spelt pretty recently, um, some emmer, so other ancient grains. Um, and, and then I also raise some, uh, some turnips for seed as well as some clover for seed. So there's a little bit more smaller plots and, and alternatives, but those, those three annuals are, are kind of our foundation crop. Uh, just curious on the organic price on Durham. What is that kind of at right now? Yeah, well, right now it is crazy. Um, so for the last uh, four years, I've been at $17 a bushel. This year, I'm getting offers of $30 to $40 a bushel. And that's really reflective in the drought. And so I think conventional Durham, if I had to guess, would be, you know, pushing 20 by January of this year. Um, and so or organics is, is ultimately riding a, a pretty similar um, price delta um, as the price for conventional goes high because of the drought. Would that be the same for flax? Flax is a little bit more stable. It's not, organic flax isn't, there's not quite as much of a commodity market. Um, so I've been about $28 for flax for, or sorry, $30 for flax for about four years. Um, right now the market's about $44 for flax. Um, but, uh, but that's again, reflective of the drought. I'm wondering, Nate, um, maybe a little bit about how you approach marketing. I mean, have you been in it long enough that you're selling the same people every year or are you still making a lot of phone calls to find out about pricing and delivery? And, um, yeah, maybe just talk a little bit about how you approach marketing. Yeah, so um, I don't really know how this came to be, but in Montana, in the organic community, there's a real culture of forward contracting. And so the buyers who have been working with the folks who have been at this for, you know, 30 plus years, um, oftentimes put out a contract saying, you know, we'll give you a three year contract for hardwood spring wheat or Durham. Um, and over those three years, it's going to be the same price or there's going to be, you know, kind of a floating floor and ceiling. And so I've... Um, at our conference, our Montana Organic Association conference, we lots of times have um, a whole suite of buyers who show up looking to sign contracts of for acres um, the following spring. And so that's one source of folks to find a, or a way to find buyers. The buyers I have now, I've been working with for about four to six years, um, but I'm always, I'm always talking to buyers at these conferences and seeing what other opportunities are out there, but also, being quite candid with, um, just like I've shared my price with you, um, being quite candid with uh, my neighbors and other organic growers saying, you know, what are you raising? And do you think there's any room for me to raise something that you're raising as well? Is there a possibility? Like, I don't want to take their market, but if a buyer needs more grain, could I tack on to that and be an additional supplier? Um, we have a, a marketing cooperative in Montana, the Montana Organic Producers Co-op. And so right now we're, we're approaching buyers um, on behalf of all of us to get larger acreage contracts where we could say um, contract out 10,000 acres of a spring crop, um, realize that scale so that we have a little bit of a competitive advantage, but also get uh, the same price for all growers so that we're not competing with each other, but rather cooperating with each other. Any other questions for Nate? Oh, maybe, um, I mean, I realized it was more crop focused than cattle focused, but um, so how do you do um, marketing and sale of your organic beef? Yeah, so um, so for the past 10 years, I've this, this co-op that we do the grain through started out as a beef co-op. Um, and so we all raise our organic beef on grass to finish. So it's about 18 to 20 months um, and they're about 1200 pounds when they finish out, so a little bit smaller framed animals. Um, and we sell them on the hoof um, to a, uh, an aggregator who ultimately sells them through Whole Foods. Um, but there's 
you know, there's several different buyers out there looking for grass fed organic beef and some buyers looking for grain fed organic beef. Um, so we get $3 a pound hanging weight um, for our beef. And so depending on what it is, that's, you know, about $1,800 a finished animal. Um, and, uh, and we're aggregating our different loads. So we might not all have a pot load ready to go at the same time or at any one time, but um, between three or four of us, we can fill out a truck that ultimately makes it worth the buyer's time um, to ship it down to the slaughterhouse and then have it packed out. Yeah. Um, there's a growing demand kind of internally um, in our co-op, but also amongst other growers who are raising out grass-fed organic beef for um, these organic calves. So if you're just a cow-calf producer, there's definitely a market for the calves. Um, usually there's a, uh, a 20 to 50 cent pound premium, um, in my experience, for these calves. Um, but it all just depends on developing that relationship um, for with, with a buyer who's looking to either finish them out themselves or with a broker who's looking to move them um, to someone who's, who's finishing them out. Are they getting slaughtered in Montana primarily? Or? I wish. Um, they're mostly going down to Colorado to get slaughtered in Greeley. Um, but there's, there's more and more slaughterhouses kind of popping up and we're hoping to either as a co-op invest in one of those slaughterhouses to, to claim some, some slaughter space, um, or we're going to hopefully have a cooperative agreement with, um, a newer, a newer organic USDA inspected setup so that we could have them slaughtered in Montana. And then, uh, and then just the meat exported rather than the live animals. Mm -hmm. Um, we are at two. Any other questions for Nate? Otherwise, we'll okay. Um, thank you very much for your time, Nate.